Beardo Benjo. I am exhausted. I might look exhausted. The reason why I'm exhausted is because I've just spent four hours, maybe five hours, modding and changing the shell of my Nintendo Switch. Why the hell did you do that, I hear you ask? Well, I did it because I wanted to make this video. I wanted to make a video where I explain and find out whether the normal person, just regular Joe like myself, can in fact mod their Nintendo Switch and change the shell themselves. How long does it take? What are the risks? How difficult, honestly, is it? And is it worth it in the end? I'm going to answer all those questions today because I've just gone through that experience myself now. It's still very raw. I'm very tired. And I'm going to lay it all out there and be very, very honest about the experience. Now, I've seen multiple videos on YouTube that say it's easy. You can do it in 10 minutes. You can do this. You can do that. And yeah, you know what? You might be able to. But there are still risks, especially if you go into this for the first time, like I did today. There's a lot of things that could happen that you need to be aware of before making that decision. Now, spoiler alert, I'll jump to the end. Yes. It did work. I was able to mod it, and now I have a fantastic looking atomic purple see-through Nintendo Switch. I am very, very happy with the end result. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love it. Please excuse how dirty the screen is. It's had a rough day today. Now, I honestly do think the end result completely and utterly justifies the work that went in before it. But you do need to realize if you want to do this yourself, it is work. It's not something you can throw together in like an hour. This took me four hours and I'll get onto the reasons why it took me that long as I go through the guide of how you do this yourself. Being able to see all the inner workings and having it as that kind of really nice atomic purple. I think that's what it's called, Atomic Purple. I just think it looks incredible. It all still plays and works the way it should. The buttons still feel right. It, it, it's fantastic. It really is fantastic, but it's a lot of work. I will keep emphasizing that before you go forward into this video. Prepare yourself if you're about to embark on this journey. You need to have patience. You need to have quite a bit of time on your hands and you need to be willing and open to accept the fact that something might go wrong. Something might break and you need to be able to accept that. If your Switch is outside of warranty, by all means, give it a go. Mine was way outside of warranty. I've had this since launch day. It's it's getting on a bit now, so I was happy to do this. But if something had broken internally, that's on me. And if you go down this route, it's entirely on you. So you need to be able to make that decision in your mind comfortably and say, hey, if something breaks, my bad. I took the risk. There's nothing we can do about it. And I was happy with that. If you're happy with that, then we can proceed. Now this case here that I've used today, this Atomic Purple one comes courtesy of the company Extreme Rate. Now they're not sponsoring this video. I'm not getting paid to promote this. I wanted to make this video anyway, but Extreme Rate were kind enough to send me this case to be able to do this video, which is really, really kind of them. The quality is genuinely fantastic. If I didn't think it was, I would tell you, I'm a very honest person. Now this case, if you were to buy it yourself, costs about 29 pounds, about 28 pounds and 99 pence. I don't know what it is in uh, US, but that's the UK price. They're a UK based company, I believe. And it is on amazon.co.uk. They've got a wide range of different colors. They've got see-through green, see-through pink, see-through red, see-through, see-through, and a whole bunch of others. They've even got ones that look like NES and SNES. I actually got sent a SNES one as well, which I was very tempted to set up. But given how long this took and how difficult it was, I think I'm gonna to stick to the Atomic Purple for now. Now, if you decide to do this and you do buy one of these cases, Extreme Rates cases are pretty self-sufficient. When you open them up, they have everything in there that you need. So you've got the Switch back plate or the actual console plate itself, which you would change. You've got your buttons. You need to pop all these out, but these are the buttons that you could change out. Obviously you can use the buttons that are already on your Switch, but if you want to, they do come with their own buttons and you can buy buttons separately if you wanna jazz it up even further. It comes with two. Joy-Con shells, um, which are complete. You need to change everything, including an inner piece. I'll show you, including an inner piece, but you'll see that when I go through the build in just a moment. This bit here is the best bit in the entire package. I'm not even being sarcastic. This is a tiny bag of screws, replacement screws. Now, when you're building this and when you're stripping down your current switch, you're probably gonna lose some screws. They are very tiny. I would suggest being organized and I'll show you what I did when I show you my build. But these little screws are very easy to lose. This is a complete pack of basically all the replacement screws you could need. So if you do lose one, you're backed up. Also in this tiny package, there are two screwdriver heads. One is a Phillips screwdriver head and one is a tri-wing screwdriver head. Now these are very specific to the screws that are in the switch. The tri-wing screwdriver head in particular, you, you won't have that just laying around the house. And then finally, you get the screwdriver itself that you can attach the heads into and you're pretty much set up. 
that's everything you need to get this going. Now, the only other thing I'd say that you would need that isn't in this kit is a pair of tweezers. There are some really, really finicky, really, really tiny fiddly bits inside the switch and having a pair of tweezers really really helps to get in there and unplug certain cables and things that you need to unplug if you're going to do this build. Now before we dive into the build and I talk you through how you do this I will just preface again you really do need to be patient if you want to pull this off you really do need to be sure that you're comfortable opening your switch things can go wrong things probably will go wrong and you need to be aware of the time investment. I thought I'd get this done in an hour. I was very slow because I was very precise and I was taking care with it and it took around about four hours to do. I was very, very careful and things still went wrong. Personally, it can be done. I think it's worth it. I absolutely adore this. I think this looks incredible, I really do. But for you personally, make sure you wanna do it. Make sure you're ready for the risks that it involves. Let's dive in and I'll show you the build and talk you through exactly what I needed to do to create this. So this is my switch before I made any changes. It is a day one switch. I've had it since launch day. The only thing that's different are the yellow Joy-Cons, which I've now decided are my least favorite. And they're going to be the ones I'm going to be swapping over to the purple Joy-Cons. First things first, lay out all the components for the new shell. You should have one back part for the switch itself, two sets of Joy-Cons, all the buttons, make sure they've been popped out in preparation for setting them up, and then one kickstand. Also make sure you've got your two screwdriver heads ready to go. You should have the tri-wing screwdriver here and the Phillips head screwdriver also. The first one we're gonna be using today is the tri-wing. And don't forget to have a pair of tweezers handy as well. They really will help you do this. Now you are going to be taking out lots and lots of screws and small fiddly parts. In terms of organization, if you bought an extreme rate case, an extreme rate shell for your switch, then I actually used the insert that comes inside the box that would have transported you the replacement shell, the new shell. It makes a great little container and it's got four different compartments to separate different types of screws. Okay, the first bit we're going to do is the switch console itself. To start off, you will need your screwdriver and the tri-wing screwdriver head. Lay the switch screen side down on a flat, soft surface. I've used a mouse mat here so as to not scratch the screen. Then locate the four tri-wing screws which are in each corner of the back of the switch. These need to be unscrewed first. Once you've unscrewed those screws, change your screwdriver head to the Phillips screwdriver for the next set of screws. Next up, there's six Phillips head screws that need to be removed from the switch. There's two from the bottom. For some reason, mine only had one, so one was missing already. One at the top, one under the kickstand, and one on either side. Now the sides, where the Joy-Cons normally slot into, do have five screws, but you only need to remove one, and that's the center screw. Once all those screws have been removed and set aside nice and safe, you should be able to just gently pry open the switch. This back compartment should come away quite easily. If you need to, just try and use a little prying tool, maybe a knife, butter knife, or something like that, um, just to get in there and pry it open. Now, before you disregard that old shell, we do need to remove two parts of it and transfer them over to the new shell. The first is the game slot cover. It's one simple Phillips head screw that needs to be unscrewed. Once you've removed it from the old shell, just place it onto the new shell and screw it back into place. Then back to the old shell, we need to remove the kickstand mechanism that is still intact. Now, this is three screws, two Phillips head screws, which are a lot smaller, and one tri-wing screw. Once you've unscrewed this kickstand mechanism from the old shell, just transfer it over to the new shell and make sure the kickstand is in place. Before you screw it finally down and firmly down, make sure that the metal bar is down against the kickstand. Once that mechanism screwed in, the kickstand might feel a little bit stiff because it hasn't been used before. Try it out, make sure it feels okay, make sure it clicks out, uh, just to check if it can still stand up on its own. Now it's time to clip that new shell back onto the switch itself. Very, very simple. Just clip it in place and start screwing back in all those screws you removed before. So that's one from either side where the Joy-Cons attach, one from the top, two from the bottom, one under the kickstand, and then the four main screws that you took out first in each corner of the back of the switch. And that's it for the switch itself. This part is the easiest part. It's the Joy-Cons where it starts to get a little bit fiddly. The switch itself, I honestly believe anyone can do. It is a very straightforward process um, and it doesn't take that long either. 
Now this is where it starts to get fiddly. The left Joy-Con has four tri-wing screws on the back of the Joy-Con in the four corners, much like the Switch console did. Remove those and then gently pry apart the Joy-Con. You may need to use a pry tool once again. Once you've pried the Joy-Con open, it should open a bit like a clamshell, but all still be attached together. Now, for some reason, mine was missing a screw, so it just came apart. In this image here, however, I have circled that first screw that you need to unscrew to ensure that both halves of the Joy-Con can come apart. When setting aside that other half of the controller, do keep an eye out for this tiny little button. It can get lost very easily. It is the release button for when you're trying to remove a Joy-Con from the Switch. Once you've separated those two halves of the Joy-Con, we need to start working on the piece that has the most mechanics inside it. The piece that has the battery, the motherboard and everything else. Now the first thing we need to do on this side of the Joy-Con is to pry away the battery. Put something underneath it, a prying tool like a screwdriver or a knife and just slowly pry it away from the adhesive tape that's holding it in place. Once you've removed the battery from the adhesive tape, locate the red and black cable and then slowly pull it up and away from the motherboard. It should come away with no issue and not much resistance at all. We won't need the battery until the end now, so set it aside somewhere safe. Now that the battery is removed, the Joy-Con shell you have should look like this. Next up, locate these three Phillips head screws and remove them. Once removed, this inner section can be lifted away. Be careful though, it is still attached by a small ribbon cable, so just slowly move it to one side. Now we're getting into the really fiddly bits. This is where you're gonna need to use some tweezers. There are five ribbon cables inside the Joy-Con, the left Joy-Con, that all need to be removed. All these cables are securely fastened with a little catch. Use the tweezers to lift that catch up, just like I'm doing in the video here, and then you can slowly pull the ribbon cables away. All five need to be removed. Once all those ribbon cables have been detached, the piece you were working with should now be in three pieces. You should have the Joy-Con runner that connects to the switch, the middle section of the Joy-Con that you don't normally see, and then the piece that's still holding the motherboard. At this point, remove the L button and keep it somewhere for safekeeping. Now working with the piece of Joy-Con that still has the motherboard connected, the next thing we're going to do is remove the joystick. The joystick's held in place by two screws. One's out in the open and one is underneath one of the ribbon cables. Unscrew these screws and gently lift the joystick out of the controller. Again, set it to one side. We don't need it just now. Next up, there's two screws that are holding the motherboard in place. Gently unscrew these. Once those two screws have been unscrewed, we need to lift the motherboard from out of the Joy-Con shell. Take hold of the white block at the end of the Joy-Con and slowly wiggle it back and forth to loosen up the adhesive. Then lift that and the motherboard out of the Joy-Con shell. Once you've set that motherboard to one side, you should be left with this. Next up, we need to remove this small piece of wiring held in place by three Phillips head screws. Unscrew and put to one side. And now we need to start replacing the buttons and transferring them over to our new shell. This bit is fairly straightforward. All the buttons are held in place by a small piece of rubber. Use tweezers to take that off and then slot the new buttons or the old buttons in place on the new shell. All the buttons have slight little notches on them so they can't go in the wrong way. Just make sure they are going in the right way and you're not forcing them in. The last thing to transfer over from that old shell is a small piece of black adhesive. Peel it off with some tweezers and then move that over to the new shell. You'll know where it needs to sit because there are two circles on it and there's two nubs on the shell itself that need to sit in between those circles. Okay, now for reassembly. First things first, screw this small piece of wiring back into place where it was on the old shell onto the new shell. Once that wiring and all the buttons are in place, we need to now put the motherboard and the small white block back into place. Gently do this and make sure the piece of wire cabling is sitting on top of the motherboard, not underneath the motherboard. So that's this piece of brown wire cabling sitting on top of the motherboard, not underneath. Screw the two screws on the motherboard back into place, but don't screw them too tightly. Take a moment every now and then just to check if the buttons still press. If they feel hard to press, then loosen up these screws. Maneuver the joystick back into place and screw it back in with the two screws that were there before, two Phillips head screws. Don't forget one of these screws is hidden underneath one of the brown ribbon cables. Once that's done, we need to start working on the back side of the Joy-Con. Now here we need to attach the runner to the Joy-Con so that it can attach to the switch. And we also need to change the buttons inside the runner because currently they're set to yellow and we want them to be set to purple or whatever color shell you've purchased. Grab that release button from wherever you put it earlier, the little one that can easily roll away and place that into the new controller. 
Changing the buttons on the runner is very, very simple. The buttons are held in with two tiny screws, two tiny Phillips head screws, so remove those. Once the screws are removed and you've lifted that panel away, you should have access to the buttons inside. Simply use tweezers to lift out the yellow buttons, take the rubber apart from the yellow, put the rubber into the new buttons, and put the button back into place. Once the new buttons are in place, make sure they're the right way round and they display correctly. Then simply screw the panel back on top to secure them in place. Once you've changed the buttons within the runner, it's time to attach the runner back to the backside part of the Joy-Con itself. The runner's held in place with one Phillips head screw. Now it's time for the worst bit. Pick up that inner piece of the Joy-Con that has the ZL button attached. We need to remove the ZL button. This is quite hard to do, and it's a little bit difficult to explain. You need to almost push down the back side of the controller while lifting up the top side. Mm, sounds a bit strange. Push down the part of the button that's closest to Z and lift up the part of the button that's closest to L. It should lift away, but be very careful when you do so. There are two springs under here. If they do shoot off, don't worry. You have got spares inside your bag that came with the shell. Once it's off, just take note where the springs go. There are two little nubs that the springs sit on. This will be important soon. Remove the small piece of wiring that's attached to the controller and transfer that over to your new controller. Screw that piece of wiring down inside your new shell. There should be two small pillars inside your new shell for two springs to sit on. Sit the springs on them. Now another fiddly part, when attaching your new ZL button, there are two nubs on the inside of it that need to go on top of the springs. Line them up and then push that button into place. This can be a little bit fiddly. Again, it's very difficult to explain how this is done. You just need to make sure that the springs are aligned with the nubs and you push it downwards and up towards its normal position on the controller. It is very hard to do. It might take a little while. Okay, now it's time to pack it all back up. Let's start working back on the piece with the motherboard and start plugging in all those ribbon cables once again. Again, use tweezers here. Make sure you do it gently. Push them into place and then lock the clasps back in the place where they were before we started. Attach the two cables from the runner attached to the back part of the controller into the motherboard. Plug the ribbon cable attached to the inner part of the controller that holds the ZL button back into the motherboard. Don't forget to lock that clasp back down. Fold that inner Joy-Con piece back into the correct place so it feels natural again and screw it back into place. Pop the battery back into its compartment. Then the final fiddly bit, use a pair of tweezers to grab that battery cable and connect them back to the motherboard. It does look more fiddly than it actually is. It just needs to sit bang on top of the pins and be pushed down. It doesn't need to connect from the side, it needs to connect from the top downwards, so push it into the connector. Once that's done, fold the back on, click it together, and then screw the four screws back into place. You should see a light at this point. If you don't see a light at this point, something has gone wrong. Sadly, during the build, I did encounter an issue where one of my Joy-Cons completely died. It was showing light right up to the end, right up to the last screw, and then for some reason it died on me. I'm not sure why. Double check after you put the battery in that you've still got lights flashing up. This is one of the risks of doing a build this way. You can encounter problems and you might lose some Joy-Cons. Now the right Joy-Con is very similar, but does have a couple of different little fiddly bits that the left Joy-Con doesn't have. When you first open it up, you'll encounter the first one, which is this small black square. Lift that up and move it to one side. Proceed as normal after doing so and start to remove the battery. The small black square is connected with a gray cable. This needs to be lifted up and away from the motherboard, much like the battery cable, with a pair of tweezers. Much like the left Joy-Con, go through the same motions, taking apart the three central pieces. The small difference here is the cables are a lot shorter that connect them. The ribbon cables are shorter, so be a little bit more careful when taking them apart. This motherboard also only has four ribbon cables that need to be disconnected with a pair of tweezers. One of the other differences with the right Joy-Con to the left Joy-Con is when taking the motherboard out of the Joy-Con shell, it's held in with two different extra things. It has the white block, much like the left controller, but it also has a black base plate, which is stuck down with adhesive, and then the black infrared sensor, which is also stuck down with adhesive. When you unstick these, it should all remove as one piece. Motherboard, infrared sensor, white block, and the black base plate. It's a little bit fiddlier to stick in than just sticking in the motherboard, but if you do it black faceplate first, then infrared, then the white block, and then the motherboard, it should sit quite comfortably. It's 
Same again with the screws, just bear in mind where you take them from and don't screw them too tight. Double check buttons as you're putting everything back into place in the new controller shell. The fiddliest part of the right Joy-Con is reattaching the midsection that holds the shoulder button. This part is very difficult and took me a little while. For some reason, this ribbon is just in an awkward, awkward place and is very difficult to attach back onto the motherboard. You might struggle with this for a little while. Follow all the same steps for the left Joy-Con, putting everything back into the same place and remembering where you take screws from. At the end of piecing together the right Joy-Con though, you will need to perform one more extremely fiddly step, and that's re-plugging in the small black square with the gray cable. The grey cable has a gold connector on the end that needs to be pushed directly down onto a pin on the motherboard. It's extremely fiddly and took me a little while. Once it's all done, clip it back together, tighten those screws and you should be good to go. I only glossed over the right controller because it is very, very similar to the left. Just bear in mind where you're taking screws from and then make sure you're putting them back in the right places. The left Joy-Con build though is very, very similar. It's almost identical to the right apart from the few differences I mentioned. So that's the only thing to really focus on. And there we have it, a finished, modded, beautiful Switch. Replacing these shells is a fantastic experience and I couldn't be happier with the result. It really does look fantastic, but it is not for the faint of heart. During this process, it took me about four hours, possibly longer. I did lose one Joy-Con in the process. I'm not even entirely sure what went wrong. I got right to the end of the build and it was all working perfectly. I screwed in the last few screws and it all went wrong and stopped showing battery power. It's just one of the risks that you take when you go into this kind of thing. If you take apart and mod any piece of technology, you have to be aware of the risks and you have to be able to accept them if they do happen. Sadly for me, I lost a Joy-Con today, but the end result is still fantastic and I do love the shell I have. My overall verdict is this. If you want to do this, be aware that it's not particularly easy. It is very fiddly. If you've never done anything like it before, it will probably take you a substantial amount of time, but I would advise you to take that time. Be careful, do it slowly, and make sure you're really looking at everything you do. I did that, and I still lost a Joy-Con. I can't say why. It could be salvageable, but I cannot figure it out. Another issue I ran into with the build a few times was deadheading the screws. Some of these screws require you to push down quite hard and spin very slowly. If you so much as spin quickly and don't put enough pressure on them, you can deadhead screws very easily and then won't be able to get into the switch at all. If this is something that you do want to pursue, then honestly do check out Extreme Rates cases on Amazon. They're fantastic quality. I'm not just saying that. They really are great. I would tell you if they were bad quality, but they're fantastic. It is just a lot of work to pull this off, so please make sure you want to do it before jumping in. I wouldn't want you wasting any money and I wouldn't want you breaking your switch because that would really, really suck. In conclusion, it's not easy, but it is worth it. If you're patient, you take the time and you follow a guide or two, you'll get there and you'll get a fantastic result in the end. But beware, things can go wrong and be ready to accept it if it does.